The mediastinum extends from the thoracic inlet to the diaphragm, and it's often subdivided into three compartments, the anterior mediastinum, the middle mediastinum, and the posterior mediastinum. As chest radiologists, we typically use the anterior surface of the great vessels in the heart as the boundary between the anterior and middle mediastinum, and we often use the anterior surface of the thoracic spine as the boundary between the middle and posterior mediastinum. The middle mediastinum is a topic of this talk. Middle mediastinal disorders can arise from six sources. Three are major conduit systems, the trachea, the great vessels, and the esophagus. Two are not visible unless they're abnormally enlarged, lymph nodes and bronchopulmonary foregut malformations. And one is an intruder from the neck, the thyroid. Three, two, one. Since we discussed the trachea in our large airways disorders talk, this talk will have five instead of six sections, starting with the great vessels. The great vessels are the vascular conduits that carry blood directly to and from the heart. So that's the central veins, the pulmonary arteries, and the thoracic aorta. Let's start upstream with the central veins. There are six central venous conditions I'd like you to be familiar with. Central venous obstruction. Central venous obstruction can occur when the endothelium of the central veins is damaged by, say, a central line or cardiac conduction lead. It can happen in the setting of DVT. It can also happen in the setting of intrathoracic mass effect. Another cause is inflammation caused by, say, radiation therapy or fibrosing mediastinitis. Most of the time, there won't be any obvious findings on chest x-ray. However, occasionally, dilated venous collaterals might present themselves if you know where to look on the x-ray. One example is the left superior intercostal vein, which is a tributary of the left brachycephalic vein. I've got a white arrow pointing at the left brachycephalic vein here, and a pink arrow pointing at the left superior intercostal vein. The left superior intercostal vein is normal in this image, but in central venous obstruction, it becomes dilated, or it can become dilated. And since it parallels the lateral margin of the aortic arch, you may see a bump along the lateral margin of the aortic arch on a frontal chest x-ray when it's enlarged. People refer to this as the aortic nipple. With central venous obstruction, and sometimes the asgus vein can be dilated too. On this image, I have a white arrow pointing at the SVC and a pink arrow pointing at the asgus. The asgus is normal in size on this image, but when it becomes dilated, you can see a large oval opacity in the right tracheobronchial angle, immediately above where the right main stem bronchus takes off from the trachea. On CT imaging, not only are the occluded central veins often directly observable, but enlarged venous collaterals, um, maybe two. If uh, you've injected intravenous contrast into the patient, into a patient, these collaterals will be filled with relatively undilute, brightly enhancing contrast, like on this example, where you can see um, brightly enhancing contrast in many collateral veins in the chest wall. Um, on this image, we see an enlarged superior intercostal vein. No contrast in the SVC, um, some dilated collateral veins in the mediastinum, um, also in the anterior left cardiophrenic space, and even a bit of focal hyperenhancement in the liver um, secondary to this um, collateral venous flow. If we encounter a central venous occlusion, um, it's also usually a good idea to see if you can determine the cause. Most of the time, Patients of central venous occlusion are asymptomatic. However, in some folks, central venous drainage can become so impaired that edema develops in the face and arms, and the patient may even have difficulty breathing. Folks usually refer to this symptomatic state of central venous occlusion as SVC syndrome. In folks with SVC syndrome, the findings of central venous occlusion often are much, much more overt, like on this CT. Um, if you look at the subcutaneous um, tissues, uh, the subcutaneous fat in the chest wall, you can see how infiltrated all this fat is representing volume overload. Enlarged varices are another central venous disorder. 
When varices become very large, they can manifest as a retrocardiac mediastinal mass on chest x-ray that sort of resembles a hiatal hernia on both frontal and lateral images sometimes. However, the diagnosis of enlarged varices on CT is, however, relatively trivial, especially um, if you've given the patient intravenous contrast. Um, places, good places to look for um, varices are uh, around the lower esophagus and near the cardiophrenic angles. Duplicated SVCs. Duplicated SVCs are an anatomic variant that's usually not picked up on CT unless a catheter or other central venous device happens to be coursing within a left-sided um, SVC, for example. On this image, you can see that there are two cardiac conduction leads um, that reach the heart via the right SVC and one that gets there via the left SVC. On CT, you'll recognize the patient has a duplicated SVC. When you're scrolling and you see a tubular structure in the left mediastinum that connects with the coronary sinus. On this CT, watch how the contrast column in the left brachiocephalic vein courses longitudinally in the left mediastinum, while the right-sided SVC, which I point to with a white arrow, courses parallel on the right side. Watch how the contrast column in the left SVC drains into the coronary sinus and enters the right atrium. Left SVCs. A small portion of the population has a less common SVC variant, a non-duplicated left-sided SVC, um, like on this chest x-ray. Although on this image, on the x-ray alone, you could not necessarily um, exclude the possibility of a duplicated SVC. In these fields, however, um, the CTs are diagnostic. You'll see no SVC on the right side, and the SVC, left-sided SVC will be larger than the left SVC in a duplicated SVC syndrome, um, in, in a SV, duplicated SVC um, patient, since uh, all of the blood is returning from the upper body via this left-sided pathway. And you can just see how large this coronary sinus is compared to the example of um, duplicated SVC we just saw several slides ago. As is continuation. In some folks, um, a central venous anatomic variant involves the IVC. In people with ASGIS continuation, the intrahepatic IVC is absent, and venous return from the abdomen and legs doesn't return to the right atrium via the IVC. In these folks, venous return occurs via the ASGIS or hemiasgus veins, and ultimately returns to the heart via the ASGIS arch, which becomes quite large because of the amount of venous return it needs to handle, um, and then subsequently into the SVC. Here are some matching coronal images that show venous return from the lower body return in a wide ASGIS vein that reaches the large ASGIS arch and dumping into the SVC. On chest x-ray, the widely dilated ASGIS or hemiasgus veins may be visible as vertical bands that parallel the descending aorta, though I have to admit this is probably a finding that I'm more likely to see retrospectively than prospectively. PAPVR. Um, PAPVR is the final central venous con uh, condition that I'd like you to be familiar with. In PAPVR, some of the pulmonary veins return to the heart via the systemic central veins and right atrium instead of the central pulmonary veins and the left atrium. On this coronal MPR, you can see how a conspicuous pulmonary vein drains the upper left arm into the left brachiocephalic vein instead of the left atrium. There are many different types of PAPVR, and folks often classify them according to where they drain to. Um, the SVC or central veins in the chest, um, the IVC or central veins in the abdomen, or directly to the right side of the heart. Um, on occasion, PAPVRs could exhibit mixed drainage. Okay, um, that's the central veins. Uh, now let's shift downstream a little and talk about the pulmonary arteries. There are four pulmonary arterial conditions that I'd like you to be familiar with. We're going to focus on the pulmonic stenosis and pulmonary slings in this talk, since I'll be discussing pulmonary arterial enlargement and pulmonary thromboembolic disease in our Hyler disorders talk. However, I do want to say 
a few brief words about pulmonary arterial enlargement. In cases of pronounced pulmonary arterial enlargement, we may notice an additional mogul, that's where the pink arrow um, is, between the small mogul that we recognize as the aortic knob, if that's where the white arrow is, and the large mogul, that's the heart, uh, where the yellow arrow is. In some patients, uh, you might even also get a good view of the interlobar pulmonary on the right side as well. Um, traditionally, folks um, have used an interlobar pulmonary artery diameter of over 18 millimeters as another sign of pulmonary arterial enlargement. On CT imaging, uh, traditionally, uh, people have used 30 millimeters for the main pulmonary artery and 18 millimeters for the interlobar pulmonary artery as thresholds for pulmonary arterial enlargement. Um, however, um, some folks have reservations regarding the data from which these thresholds were derived. So um, try to take these numbers with a grain of salt. Okay, let's move on to pulmonic stenosis. Asymmetric left pulmonary arterial enlargement can sometimes be seen on the chest x-ray of patients with long-standing pulmonic stenosis, um, and also on their chest CTs too. Uh, folks believe that pulmonic stenosis can cause a high velocity blood, a jet of blood across the pulmonic vein that is preferentially directed towards the left pulmonary artery, which predisposes to asymmetric left pulmonary arterial enlargement. Pulmonary slings. Pulmonary slings are an anatomic variant where the left pulmonary artery arises from the right pulmonary artery instead of the main pulmonary artery. In these people, the left pulmonary artery wraps around the trachea, passes between the trachea and esophagus before heading to the left lung. The course of the left pulmonary artery results in a vascular ring uh, that can compress the lower trachea and right main stem bronchus and sometimes cause symptoms that on occasion may even require surgery. Um, a couple of airway anomalies and congenital heart disease are known to be associated with pulmonary sling. So in these folks, um, it's a good idea to take a second look at the patient's heart and trachea. Okay, let's move on to the thoracic aorta. Six thoracic aorta conditions I'd like you to be familiar with are aneurysms, PAUs, intramural hematomas, dissections, traumatic aortic injury, and a few congenital vascular rings. Before we start, um, I want to mention that this talk is more of a middle mediastinal talk than an aorta talk. So um, this section will be a kind of a big picture overview of thoracic aortic disorders um, that in actuality probably deserve their own dedicated talks. Okay, with that out of the way, let's begin. Thoracic aortic aneurysm. Thoracic aortic aneurysms can present on chest x-rays as uh, mediastinal widening or a broad convex mediastinal contour. Focal um, thoracic aortic aneurysms can sometimes appear as a focal mass where you think the aorta should be. However, um, these imaging features tend to be limited in their sensitivity and specificity. Um, sometimes a thoracic aortic aneurysm is not readily apparent on chest x-ray. And then there are some times where we think there is an aortic aneurysm there, but it ends up just being a tortuous non-aneurysmal aorta or some other sometimes serious issue like a thoracic aortic an uh, dissection. Um, so um, the imaging features um, uh, suggesting a thoracic aortic aneurysm on chest x-ray are, are, again, limited in their sensitivity and specificity. Um, however, our sensitivity and specificity for thoracic aortic aneurysms is considerably better on chest CT, especially um, enhanced chest CT. Enhanced chest CT affords us a means of accurately measuring the amount of enlargement and the amount of change uh, much more accurately. Uh, these are important as the risk of um, thoracic aortic rupture and death is directly tied to aortic size and growth rates. When we're measuring thoracic aortas, it's ideal to be able to measure the thoracic aorta's diameter in a plane that is perpendicular to the direction of blood flow, which requires software to work with the CT volume in 3D. Um, it's customary um, to measure the thoracic aorta at standard anatomic landmark as well. Um, common landmarks that we use to measure and report thoracic aortic diameters are um, at the sinuses of El Salva, the sinotubular junction, the 
mid-ascending aorta at the level of the main pulmonary artery, the aortic arch at the origin of the left subclavian artery, the descending aorta at the level of the main pulmonary artery, and at the aortic hiatus. It's customary to measure from outer wall to outer wall when we draw our digital calipers. Measurements of the thoracic aorta at the aortic root um, require an appreciation for the anatomy of the aorta and the aortic valve at this location. In most people, um, there are three flaps of tissue between the annulus, um, that's where the left ventricle meets the aortic root, and the sinotubular junction, uh, which is where the aortic root meets the ascending aorta. Um, these three flaps open and close with each heartbeat um, to permit blood to move from the heart to the aorta, but not backwards. Uh, we refer to these flaps as leaflets or cusps, uh, which um, are better known actually as just the aortic valve. Um, each leaflet or cusp is attached to the wall of the aortic root, um, and the aortic root bulges out where each cusp is, and we call each of these bulges a sinus of Valsalva. The point along the wall of the aortic root where each leaflet touches the adjacent leaflet is called a commissure. And now, if you look at the CT image on the right on this slide, you can see that there are three sinuses. Um, a right coronary sinus, uh, from which the right coronary artery arises, a left coronary sinus, from which the left coronary artery um, arises, and a non-coronary sinus. When we measure the aortic root, it's customary to measure from the outermost bulge of a sinus to the commissure on the other side. We refer to this as a cusp to commissure distance. And since there are three sinuses, three individual measurements are usually taken and recorded for the aortic root. Since we're doing all this measuring and reporting of thoracic aortic diameters, it's important to know when the numbers we're measuring reach an important threshold. And a pretty important threshold is when a patient may need to go for surgical repair of that thoracic aortic aneurysm. For patients with no underlying disorders, cardiothoracic surgeons usually like to go in once a thoracic aortic aneurysm has reached or is rapidly approaching 55 millimeters diameter or if the aneurysm is, is growing over one centimeter in diameter a year. Um, you'll find that the thresholds are slightly more aggressive um, in folks with comorbidities like bicuspid um, aortic valves Marfan syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos, as you can see on this table. Now, although atherosclerosis is the most common cause of a thoracic aortic aneurysm, it's not the only cause. Sometimes the location of a thoracic aortic aneurysm can give us hints to the cause. Um, the appearance of the wall of a thoracic aortic aneurysm can also give us a hint as to the cause of a thoracic aortic aneurysm. So for example, um, seeing thick and enhancing aortic walls may suggest a more inflammatory cause. A patient's presentation can also sometimes give a hint as to the cause of a thoracic aortic aneurysm. For example, um, if we were to encounter a thoracic aortic aneurysm in a young patient, we'd probably favor disorders like Marfan's or Takayasu's over something like atherosclerosis. PAUs, penetrating atherosclerotic ulcers, are the next topic we'll cover. Let's start by talking about how they happen. We'll begin with a normal, healthy thoracic aorta um, on this image here. Um, the wall of this aorta has three layers, an inner intima, a media um, composed of mostly smooth muscle, and an outer adventitia. As atherosclerosis occurs, a layer of atherosclerotic plaque begins to accumulate along the inner wall of the thoracic aorta. Ulcers can sometimes form within the atherosclerotic plaque, but not deep enough to breach the intima. We refer to this condition as an ulcerated atherosclerotic plaque. The ulceration of the atheromatous plaque can eventually breach the intima and penetrate into the media. When this happens, we refer to this as a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer or PAU. PAUs can sometimes lead to bleeding within the media of the aortic wall. Uh, this bleeding is usually contained 
and we refer to this kind of contained bleeding within the aortic wall as an intramural hematoma, or IMH. Sometimes PAUs can progress further and lead to a several centimeter long dissection within the media. In other folks, the ulceration may progress through the entire media and lead to the develop of a pseudoaneurysm. At this stage, the only thing that's preventing a rupture of blood through the aortic wall is the connective tissue within a thin layer of adventitia. We tend to encounter most PAUs in elderly folks. Um, the prognosis of PAUs is mixed. Um, some are asymptomatic and stable for many years, while others uh, go on to rupture. Um, because PAUs can lead to IMHs, dissections, and pseudoaneurysms, it's usually a good idea to be on a lookout for these complications when you encounter a PAU. Um, this means, though, that we have to know how to identify a PAU on CT, and it can sometimes be a little tricky, since ulcerated atherosclerotic plaques can resemble PAUs. Um, two features that can help us distinguish a PAU from an ulcerated atherosclerotic plaque are uh, one, um, the margins of the intraluminal contrast pool with the wall um, look different. PAUs tend to be uh, tend to have a smoother interface, while ulcerated plaques exhibit a more undulating interface. Um, the other hint is uh, look at the contrast within the ulcerated area. Um, if it's at a deeper level than the calcifications in the intima, um, there's a lot probably a better likelihood you're dealing with a PAU as opposed to an ulcer ulcerated atherosclerotic plaque. Um, here's an example of a patient uh, with a PAU. And you, on this image, you can see how there is an outpouching of contrast, that's what the pink arrow is pointing to, beyond a fine intimal calcification, that's where the green arrow is pointing to. Um, there's also a kind of a large low attenuation bulge posterior to the PAU, and that's a pseudoaneurysm. Intramural hematomas. IMHs um, are a contained bleed within the wall of the aorta, um, usually within the media. Uh, PAUs are one cause of IMHs, though IMHs can also happen in the setting of trauma, um, and many others occur just spontaneously. Um, the prognosis of IMHs varies. Um, people will estimate that a half resolve by themselves. However, uh, a quarter may progress to a pseudoaneurysm or aneurysm, and another quarter uh, may progress to dissection. Um, IMHs cannot be detected on chest x-ray, um, though some can be detected on CT. Um, IMHs um, present on non-contrast CT as um, subtle hyperattenuation within the wall of the aorta, as you can see on these images here. You can see how there's just like a hyperlucent kind of a crescent where the um, aortic wall should be. Um, ironically, um, if you give intravenous contrast, they're actually a bit tougher to recognize. Um, thoracic aortic dissections. Um, dissections are another thoracic aortic disorder uh, we take seriously because of the potential complications of an untreated thoracic aortic dissection. Um, besides frank rupture into the mediastinum, sometimes um, a dissection may progress upstream and either ruptured into the pericardium or damage the integrity of the aortic valve. Um, sometimes um, the dissection plant may progress upstream into a coronary artery or a carotid artery, which can result into a, in an MI or a stroke. Um, in this type A dissection, the dissection has proceeded all the way upstream to the aortic root and has ruptured into the pericardial space, resulting in a per hemopericardium under arterial pressure. Thoracic aortic injuries. Um, aortic injuries can sometimes occur in the setting of severe trauma like an MVA or a fall from height. Uh, the three most common sites of an aortic tear in this kind of setting are the aortic isthmus near the site of the ligamentum arteriosum um, at the aortic root and at the aortic hiatus, the diaphragm. Uh, unfortunately, the survival rate from aortic injuries at the aortic root and diaphragmatic hiatus are quite poor in the field. So most traumatic injuries that we encounter in radiology are the ones that actually can make it to the trauma bay, um, the ones near the aortic isthmus. Chest x-ray findings of traumatic aortic injury include uh, mediastinal widening caused by the mediastinal hematoma from a leaking aorta, 
um, and displacement of the trachea or esophagus rightwards away from a mediastinal hematoma that's probably emanating from the region of the aortic isthmus on the left side. Um, now, these aren't the only chest x-ray findings of acute aortic injury, um, but uh, for those, uh, we'll refer you to a much more comprehensive discussion um, that occurs in both the thoracic trauma and how to read frontal chest x-ray talks. Um, as opposed to observing only the secondary effects of an of a acute thoracic aortic injury, um, i.e. mediastinal hematoma, um, chest CT affords us an opportunity to sometimes see the aortic injury directly in addition to its secondary effects. So um, we could see perhaps in some patients a small intimal flap, like on this image, caused by disruption of the intima's integrity. Um, or um, say on this image here, where we have a focal pseudoaneurysm at the site of injury. Uh, we can see mediastinal hematomas in CT. However, mediastinal hematomas tend to be uh, somewhat nonspecific as it turns out the majority of mediastinal hematomas in the setting of trauma are due to venous rather than arterial bleeding. Uh, one final caveat. Um, this is about assessing the images of patients for traumatic aortic injury on CT. Just be cognizant of whether the images you're looking at are of sufficient quality to make a confident decision. All right, the final thoracic aorta topic I'd like to review um, are variant aortic anatomy and vascular rings. Vascular rings occur during embryogenesis when portions of primitive aortic arch elements regress or persist in unexpected ways. Three congenital vascular rings can occur that may cause symptomatic compression of the trachea or esophagus. These are the right aortic arch with aberrant left subclavian artery, the double aortic arch, and the pulmonary sling. Let's talk about the right aortic arch with aberrant left subclavian artery. We'll use a primitive double aortic arch model conceived by Jesse Edwards in 1948. Edwards proposed um, that a double aortic arch with bilateral patent ducti arteriosi develops early in embryogenesis and that regression of different segments results in different aortic configurations. For example, in most people, um, he postulated that the right aortic arch between the right subclavian artery and left aortic arch regresses during embryogenesis. This results in the normal left aortic arch configuration present in most people. In a small number of people, however, a different segment of the primitive double aortic arch regresses. The short segment between the left common carotid artery and left subclavian artery. This results in a right-sided aortic arch with an aberrant left subclavian artery. The aberrant left subclavian artery passes behind the trachea and esophagus in this situation. Since the ligamentum arteriosum is tethering the aberrant left subclavian artery to the main pulmonary artery, um, the, um, a complete constraining vascular ring is created around the trachea and esophagus. In some folks with this aortic arch variant, a short aneurysm could also develop at the origin of the aberrant left subclavian artery. We refer to this aneurysm as a, quote, diverticulum of Camerel, unquote, and its present further constrains the inner diameter of the vascular ring because it takes up space, um, which can increase the odds of symptomatic compression of the trachea or esophagus. Diverticulums of Camerel can occur with uh, both aberrant left subclavian arteries in the setting of a right aortic arch and aberrant right subclavian arteries in the setting of a left aortic arch. Because the larger um, comoral diverticula are at risk of dissection or rupture, um, some are managed with TVAR or bypass. This is a chest x-ray of a patient with a right aortic arch and on their enhanced chest CT, we can see the right aortic arch and an aberrant left subclavian artery ascending from the descending aorta that travels behind the trachea and esophagus. Now, in a very small number of people, no segments of the primitive double aortic arch regress, resulting in a persistent double aortic arch. Double aortic arches, however, are rarely balanced. Um, usually one side is larger than the other. Um, here's a right arch dominant double aortic arch. Um, another 
right arch dominant double aortic arch and a left arch dominant double aortic arch. Vascular rings can sometimes be inferred on lateral radiography. Um, traditionally, um, on a barium swallow, um, it's taught that double aortic arches and right aortic arches with an aberrant left subclavian artery result in a posterior indentation upon the esophageal enteric contrast column, while an anterior indentation is observed with pulmonary slings. Esophageal disorders um, can be divided into three buckets, masses, dilation, and wall abnormalities. So three buckets, masses, dilation, and wall abnormalities. Esophageal masses. Um, well, we're going to divide this into three hollow masses and one uh, group of solid uh, masses. Hiatal hernias. Um, larger hiatal hernias can present on chest x-ray as a mass overlying the thoracic spine and cardiac silhouette on a frontal chest x-ray just above the diaphragm. Um, because the esophageal hiatus is posterior to the heart, um, large hiatal hernias can present as a mass between the cardiac silhouette and lower thoracic spine on a lateral chest x-ray. A number of other disorders can mimic the appearance of a large hiatal hernia on chest x-ray. Um, things like a large epiphrenic esophageal diverticulum, um, a large esophageal neoplasm, um, bronchopulmonary foregut cysts, um, or large parasophageal varices. However, if you're able to see an air fluid level within this mass, um, that's very helpful because it's practically diagnostic for a hiatal hernia and unlikely to be seen in the confounders. Hiatal hernias can contain air, fluid, or food. Um, here's an example of a large one on uh, chest CT. Epiphrenic diverticula. Um, these um, are focal outpouchings from the lower esophagus near um, the esophageal hiatus on these images right here. Uh, Zanker's diverticula are small focal outpouchings from the upper esophagus near the neck base. And we'll stop at this image. Um, in this image here, um, the yellow arrow is pointing to the collapsed esophagus and the pink arrow is pointing to an air-filled Zanker's diverticulum. Okay, we've tackled um, the three hollow esophageal masses, so let's tackle solid esophageal tumors. Um, the solid esophageal tumors are often invisible on chest x-ray. Um, they tend to become um, callable on chest x-ray um, only when they've become either very large or if they happen to be obstructing the esophageal lumen in such a way that um, there's visible dilation of the upstream esophagus. Um, we have a decent chance of seeing medium and large esophageal masses on CT, though um, small masses and subtle um, finding, um, uh, neoplasms can sometimes still be hard to see on CT. Um, however, with medium and large size masses, um, sometimes um, imaging findings may offer a hint as to what type of tumor you're dealing with. Um, irregularly marginated masses and eccentric uh, mass-like thickening um, tend to be very suspicious for carcinoma, while smoothly marginated eccentric masses tend to favor leiomyomas and leiomyosarcomas. Uh, leiomyomas tend to be uh, more homogeneous in appearance as opposed to leiomyosarcomas. Um, lipomas and fibrovascular polyps um, usually exhibit internal fat, so if you see internal fat, um, that's helpful. Um, the pattern of fat is relatively uniform in a lipoma and more heterogeneous in a fibrovascular polyp. And finally, um, some fibrovascular polyps may even exhibit the classic morphology of a long, elongated intraluminal esophageal mass, if you uh, look carefully. Um, esophageal, um, esophageal dilation, um, that can occur in the setting of um, either um, an obstructing downstream benign or malignant mass. Um, it can also occur um, in, the, in other non-mass settings, um, like an obstructing distal stricture, um, presbyosophagus in old age, um, scleroderma, or, or achalasia. Um, achalasia, um, you may remember, can be either primary or secondary um, to issues such as Chagas disease or maybe a gastric tumor that's infiltrating the, um, the GE junction. Esophageal dilation can manifest um, on chest x-ray as a diffuse convex bulge of the right mediastinum of, um, if it's uh, dilated enough. 
Um, sometimes uh, interluminal food debris or gas um, can be even discerned, um, usually because it looks kind of mottled in its appearance. However, um, chest x-ray really, however, offers hints as to what the cause of the dilation itself is. Um, chest CT can sometimes offer us a hint or two about the cause of um, esophageal dilation, which you may, which is uh, relatively trivial to, uh, to diagnose. Um, sometimes, for example, on chest CT, um, a downstream mass obstructing esophagus may be visible. Other times, uh, you might see interstitial lung disease. That really helps point the esophageal dilation towards scleroderma as a cause. Um, however, um, there are plenty of other times where no obvious smoking gun is revealed, and we're left with a differential diagnosis that includes old age, a benign downstream stricture, primary achalasia, or achalasia secondary to issues like gastric cancer or Chagas disease. Um, here is an example of a patient um, with um, a dilated esophagus um, filled with um, fluid. And on their lung windows, um, you can see ILD. Um, this is all um, findings in a setting of scleroderma. Uh, finally, some esophageal disorders are not masses, um, um, not masses, not dilation, uh, but rather um, disorders of the wall itself, um, specifically esophagitis and esophageal perforation. Um, inflammation in the setting of esophagitis is usually not detectable on chest x-ray. However, on CT, it can sometimes manifest as mild diffuse wall thickening. Uh, people say that on enhanced imaging, um, sometimes uh, you have a situation where you see fluid in the lumen and enhancing mucosa and then uh, relatively poorly enhancing submucosa that can result in a targetoid appearance um, in folks with esophagitis. Um, esophageal perforation on the end um, um, is another disorder we need to uh, kind of be familiar with. Uh, this can occur in the context of malignancy, um, trauma, or, or barotrauma. trauma. Um, esophageal perforation uh, can potentially manifest on chest x-ray as things like pneumomediastinum or soft tissue air dissecting into the neck from the mediastinum. However, um, other signs of an esophageal perforation, uh, such as uh, pleural effusion or mediastinal widening, are, are pretty nonspecific. Um, enteric contrast into the mediastinum or pleural space um, uh, could conceivably be observed in the chest CT of a patient with esophageal perforation. Um, however, this generally would only happen with relatively large perforations. Uh, contrast extrapolation just doesn't always occur in the setting of smaller uh, esophageal perforations um, on CT. Um, and another thing is uh, the perforation itself is rarely visible on CT, um, especially if the esophagus is in a collapsed state. Uh, frankly speaking, we, we usually just kind of rely on extra luminal air and fluid in the mediastinum and the absence of other competing diagnoses to help us try our best to diagnose esophageal perforation on CT. And here's an example of a patient with an esophageal perforation. We see a small amount of gas in the mediastinum. We don't really see any evidence of um, overt um, anterior contrast extravasation. All right, lymph nodes. Lymphadenopathy um, is the most common cause of a medial mediastinal mass. Um, on chest x-ray, um, lymphadenopathy is very often invisible. Um, however, um, there are some high yield um, anatomic sites um, that we should be always kind of trying to assess on chest x-ray to make sure we're not missing a case of lymphadenopathy that we could call. Um, these three sites that we should be paying extra attention to are the right paratracheal stripe, whether it's thickened or not, um, the AP window, whether that AP window concavity is filled in or not, and finally, subcranial fullness. Um, let's start with the right paratracheal stripe on chest x-ray. Um, it's usually a very, very thin stripe, less than two millimeters in thickness, basically a thin white line on a PA chest x-ray. Um, this thin line is created by um, air within the right lung and air in the tracheal lumen um, bordering a thin right lateral tracheal wall. Uh, in the setting of lymphadenopathy, um, um, in the right paratracheal area, uh, what you might witness is no longer a thin um, stripe that's less than two millimeters long, uh, wide, I mean, but a mass um, in that space immediately to the right of the trachea, or perhaps soft tissue thickening um, in this area too. 
um, all signs that potentially could point to lymphadenopathy. However, um, there are a number of mimics that can also widen the right paratracheal stripe. Um, SVC shadow in the setting with the dilated SVC, um, ectatic dilated right brachycephalic arteries, um, or sometimes even the sternum shadow in an oblique patient. Um, but uh, lymphadenopathy is, you know, one potential cause. So we, we, this is why we, we pay attention to the right paratracheal stripe. The AP window is another um, kind of a high yield arrow to look. Um, in a normal situation, um, you should see a concavity um, that happens to be bordered by the aortic arch superiorly and the pulmonary artery inferiorly. Um, lymphadenopathy can cause that um, concavity to fill in and sometimes even become convex. However, there are confounders um, that can look like this too, besides lymphadenopathy. Um, things like focal aneurysms can, or even pseudoaneurysms as well. Um, the third area we kind of want to pay attention to is the subcoronal area, looking for fullness. Um, however, it is one of the harder imaging findings to make on chest x-ray. Um, but when lymphadenopathy occurs in the subcranial space, uh, you might perceive not only a kind of an opacity projecting below the crina, but increased splaying of the tracheal bifurcation angle. Okay, so unlike this case, which is normal, maybe you might recognize a more splayed open um, tracheal bifurcation. Um, Notice on this image too, not only um, is the um, tracheal bifurcation splayed compared to the normal image on the slide before, but see how it's slightly harder to see the spine in the subcranial area than lower in the um, chest where even the heart is? Um, that's because there's some sort of opacity that's um, between um, basically, you know, that's uh, overlapping the spine. Um, Confounders um, for um, this kind of um, fullness in the subcranial space and splaying of the uh, trachea bifurcation uh, include things like a bronchogenic cyst or left atrial enlargement because that's where those structures could live. Now, CT allows us to see, you know, lymphadenopathy pretty, um, pretty well. And um, one way people try to um, call lymphadenopathy is um, something like short axis diameter. Um, a common uh, threshold people might try to use is a uh, 10 millimeter short axis diameter. Uh, but it's important to realize that um, short axis diameters are not super reliable discrimination or discriminators of uh, malignancy versus benign when it comes to lymph nodes. Um, one example is this 2003 study. Um, which uh, was looking at uh, a number of uh, patients with lung cancer um, who had the benefit of going on for uh, basically um, um, surgical lymph node sampling um, to confirm what their, their lymph nodes um, category was. And in uh, three quarters of the patients who were definitively N0 by surgical lymph node sampling, um, turns out that um, at least three quarters of these folks had at least one lymph node that was over one centimeter in short axis diameter. On the other hand, a one in eight patients who were definitively N1 or N2 by surgical lymph node sampling did not have a single lymph node over one centimeter in short axis. Um, so, you know, um, take those um, short axis diameter measurements with a grain of salt. Um, so um, when we talk about lymphadenopathy, uh, what's normal? Um, small lymph nodes in the um, tracheobronchial region uh, near the right main stem bronchus um, are not unusual. Um, some people say um, measurements of up to 12 millimeters are okay. Um, it's usually um, not unusual to see some subcentimeter short axis lymph nodes in the right paratracheal and aortopulmonary stations, and perhaps some elongated lymph nodes in the subcranial and pre prevascular spaces. Um, those are things that uh, we, you know, we shouldn't be too shocked to see. However, uh, lymph nodes in other locations um, is more uncommon, and we need to be more cautious about those situations because that could in indicate true um, pathology. Um, a loose de um, definition for mild lymphadenopathy um, includes um, maybe a single lymph node uh, with short axis measurement 
of 10 to 20 millimeters or multiple lymph nodes just slightly north of a 10 millimeter short axis diameter. Um, you know, situations like this are not uncommon in the setting of interstitial lung disease or even people with uh, uh, long-standing cardiogenic edema. Um, however, you know, be aware that in the setting of lung cancer, um, cancer, you know, um, could be present in a lymph node of any size. Um, and just be aware um, when situations seem to be deviating from your normal lymph node distribution. Um, a loose definition for moderate lymphadenopathy on CT um, might be, um, you know, one, more than one or two lymph nodes that are over 20 millimeters in short axis um, diameter and uh, the presence of clinically relevant pathology. Um, Sometimes uh, the distribution of lymphadenopathy um, is very informative. Um, not only may it, may it help us become more sensitive in terms of picking up lymph nodes when we see a lung or a pleural or abnormality, on the, um, sometimes it works the other way. Um, maybe we didn't quite catch something in the lung and pleura and seeing a specific pattern of lymph nodes may prompt us to look again. Um, it's important to um, be familiar with the um, typical lymphatic drainage of the lung lobes. Uh, right upper lobe um, processes tend to result in uh, right hyalur and right paratracheal uh, lymphadenopathy, whereas left upper lobe uh, lung issues tend to uh, result in left hyalur AP window and periaortic um, lymphadenopathy. Lower lobes um, and right middle lobes um, drain into the ipsilateral hyalur, um, subcranial and right paratracheal stations. So um, we may see uh, enlarged lymph nodes in those territories with uh, lower lobe processes. Uh, when it comes to the pleura, um, understand that um, depending on what portion of the pleura you're talking to, talking about, um, those different uh, regions of pleura are associated with slightly different um, configurations or distributions of lymph nodes. So for example, um, um, posterior lower pleural processes um, have a tendency to um, be associated with, um, say, and large lymph nodes in the posterior intercostal um, stations, you know, near the costal vertebral junctions and the periaortic stations. Uh, whereas anterior lower pleural processes tend to be more associated with anterior and middle diaphragmatic um, lymph node enlargement. Uh, be aware that upper abdominal issues may um, are, be associated with mediastinal and hyalur lymph node enlargement as a, uh, in addition to left supraclavicular lymph node enlargements because of the way the thoracic duct and its tributaries um, basically communicate between the upper abdomen and the left supraclavicular space. Uh, be familiar with um, what uh, lymph nodes liver processes tend to go to and what lymph nodes peritoneal processes tend to go to. Uh, be familiar with that combinations, class combinations such as bilateral hyalur and right paratracheal lymphadenopathy may be associated with a disease like sarcoid, whereas multifocal arbitrary um, kind of groups of uh, lymphadenopathy may point to something like lymphoma. The attenuation of a lymphadenopathy may also sometimes provide hints. Um, low um, attenuation lymphadenopathy um, can sometimes be seen in the setting of TB and histo in the setting of um, you know, pronounced immunosuppression. Uh, lymphoma post-treatment can sometimes appear lower than expected for its um, attenuation, as can squamous cell carcinoma um, spread to lymph nodes. On the other side, hyperattenuating lymph nodes can be seen also in the setting of TB and histo and lymphoma post-treatment, um, but it's also been associated with um, disorders like sarcoid and silicosis. So um, if you see higher attenuation or partially calcified even uh, lymph nodes, you may want to think about this middle column. And finally, um, uh, intensely enhancing uh, lymphadenopathy um, is known to be associated with things like renal cell carcinoma, neuroendocrine tumors, carcinoids, and the rare cases of calcinoids. When it comes to lymphadenopathy, we should be prepared to offer a differential diagnosis. And I'd like you to remember three top malignant causes and three top non-malignant inflammatory causes for mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Um, for malignant mediastinal lymphadenopathy, uh, we want to think about metastatic lymphadenopathy from some other cancer, um, often say lung cancer. Um, we want to think about lymphoma. We want to think about CLL. Um, if we want to talk about non-malignant inflammatory causes of mediastinal lymphadenopathy, think about granulomatous infections, 
sarcoidosis, and pneumoconiosis. Okay, let's talk about a few of these conditions, um, starting with metastatic lymphadenopathy. Um, usually, probably most often, um, a manifestation of lung cancer spread to the lymph nodes, um, but can occur with uh, a number of other extrathoracic malignancies, including nasopharyngeal carcinomas, renal cell carcinomas, for example. Um, What's interesting, uh, small cell lung cancers um, often will just manifest visually as just what looks like mediastinal lymphadenopathy with no visible primary per se on the CT images. Then here's a case of bulky multifocal mediastinal and hilar lymphadenopathy in the setting of uh, metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Let's talk about lymphoma. Uh, we tend to think about lymphoma when we encounter a uh, multifocal lymphadenopathy in kind of an arbitrary um, distribution of spaces. Um, common sites include things like the neck, axilla, and abdomen. Uh, lymphoma can occur um, in any age and um, may sometimes be associated with B symptoms. Um, this is an example of relatively bulky multifocal lymph um, adenopathy and setting of lymphoma. Granulomatous infections. Um, some granulomatous infections can cause mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Um, the ones we think about the most are tuberculosis and histoplasmosis. Um, other endemic fungal infections like cryptococcus and, and coccidiomycosis um, are not, don't have a really strong association with um, mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Um, this particular example is um, bulky mediastinal and hyaluronic lymphadenopathy in the setting of histoplasmosis. Um, sarcoid. Um, sarcoidosis is probably the most common cause of mediastinal lymphadenopathy in young adults. Um, the classic um, lymphadenopathy pattern is bilateral hilar and right paratracheal lymphadenopathy. Okay. Well, let's now move on to bronchopulmonary forebent malformations. The cause of bronchopulmonary forebent malformations. Um, during embryogenesis, the Embryonic foregut develops eventually into the trachea and esophagus. Um, however, um, when abnormal budding of this foregut occurs during embryogenesis, sometimes those abnormal buds disconnect and become or give rise to um, bronchopulmonary foregut cysts. Um, these um, cysts um, are aligned with um, epithelium of different types of histologic character, and um, some are bronchogenic cysts. Um, these are um, bronchopulmonary, bronchopulmonary foregut cysts that are lined by um, ciliated columnar epithelium, pieces of cartilage, bronchial glands, and smooth muscle bundles. Um, sometimes what buds off um, ends up being a cyst lined by squamous epithelium, gastric mucosa, pancreatic tissue, um, and smooth muscle. Um, those are esophageal duplication cysts, uh, whereas um, rarely um, you might have um, um, buds that form um, bronchopulmonary foregut cysts that have islands of neural tissue. Those are your uncommon neuroenteric cysts. Um, bronchogenic cysts, esophageal duplication cysts, and neuroenteric cysts um, tend to have um, locations that they kind of are more commonly found in. Bronchogenic cysts are commonly seen um, adjacent to the trachea, the main stem bronchi, especially in the vicinity of the carina. Um, a small number can be found within the lung parenchyma. On the other hand, esophageal duplication cysts are more often found near the gastroesophageal junction, uh, while neuroenteric cysts uh, tend to prefer a location that's um, closer to the vertebral body, superior to the carina. The chest x-ray findings of a uh, bronchopulmonary foregut malformation um, vary from nothing at all um, to large ones where you might even be able to distinguish a mass that's um, relatively uh, well circumscribed, uh, perhaps homogeneous, oftentimes near the carina or gastroesophageal junction common places for a bronchogenic or an esophageal duplication cyst. Um, there, of course, are the rare lung masses where a bronchogenic cyst is presenting it with the lung parenchyma. Um, these malformations are sometimes associated with other vertebral anomalies. Um, so um, that could be 
an associated sign you might pick up. Um, but you can see, um, even with this case of a relatively large bronchogenic cyst, how um, tough it is to actually see that prospectively practice on a chest x-ray. Um, doing a little of a deeper dive into these cysts, starting with bronchogenic cysts. Um, bronchogenic cysts um, are usually uh, well circumscribed, uh, relatively round, with um, thin walls. Um, they can vary from small, like on this image, um, to large, like on this example. Um, now, some are filled with simple fluids, so you'll get a Hounsfield unit in that 0 to 15 or whatever range. Um, but others are not filled with simple fluid. Um, they may be filled with proteinaceous fluid or even hemorrhagic fluid and measure denser or higher in attenuation than simple fluid. This one, for example, looks isoattenuating to the um, paraspinal muscle in the chest wall. On MRI, um, bronchogenic cysts um, um, may exhibit variable T1 intensity from relatively low um, to high, depending on what the contents of the cyst are. Um, but they generally are T2 hyper intense. Um, locations. Um, people say that at least two thirds of bronchogenic cysts, um, the number may be even a little bit higher, um, are mediastinal in location. Um, of the mediastinal bronchogenic cysts, um, that subcrinal area is probably number one, like on these examples. Uh, right paratracheal is another um, location, as are hilar um, uh, bronchogenic cysts. Um, a few closing notes. Um, these bronchogenic cysts can be um, discovered at any age. And I'd say that the majority are asymptomatic and just instantly discovered when we image people. Um, the larger ones um, can lead to mass effect that could compress things like the trachea and cause symptoms. And uh, uh, we may recall that bronchogenic cysts um, in the lung are relatively rare, maybe 15 to 20%, um, but sometimes um, can become infected. Moving on to esophageal duplication cysts. Um, these are usually discovered in childhood. And uh, when, in the, when of a certain size can potentially result in uh, mass effect resulting in esophageal compression. Um, like bronchogenic cysts, they tend to be spherical, um, uh, well circumscribed, um, variable into the type of fluid they contain, um, from simple fluid to proteinaceous or hemorrhagic fluid, so attenuation values may vary. Um, walls tend to be thin. Um, the rim may enhance, but not the interior. Um, some examples of MR imaging of a, of a esophageal duplication cyst, you can see that this one um, is T1 hypo-intense, but um, T2 hyper intense. Um, occasionally, um, duplication cysts, um, esophageal duplication cysts can be infected, um, such as within um, on this example here. Um, Neuroenteric cysts um, don't have any images to show you because they're relatively rare. Um, usually discovered in, in uh, infancy and may be associated with other uh, neurological symptoms. Finally, uh, let's close with um, um, a discussion about thyroid, um, specifically thyroid enlargement, and the three conditions we'd like to um, familiarize, uh, familiarize ourselves with are um, goiters, thyroiditis, and um, uh, adenoma carcinoma. Um, when we talk about thyroid enlargement, it's important to just um, think about the thoracic end again. I remember the thoracic end is a bony ring um, uh, that's basically formed by the vertebral body, first ribs, and manubrium. It's a, it's a constrained bony ring. Um, the space inside is fixed. Um, the space inside um, is where things like the trachea, blood vessels travel. And anything that um, would be introduced into the thoracic inlet, such as, say, an enlarged thyroid um, growing from the neck into the chest, um, will push things within the thoracic inlet um, around because the space is limited. Um, and so um, because the thoracic inlet is a constrained space, enlarged thyroid um, 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 structures or masses that um, are going from neck into chest may often displace or narrow the trachea. Like on this example here, we have a, a large um, thyroid mass actually um, 
pushing the trachea uh, aside because the space within which these two structures live is constrained. All right, let's talk about goiters, multinodular goiters. Um, these are the most common um, thyroid mass, um, especially with the large ones um, where we see these um, associated with either a narrowing or displacement of the trachea um, at or near the thoracic inlet. Um, on CT imaging, you may see lots of dif different um, findings from a multilobular mass to um, basically uh, nodules to cysts or combinations thereof. And calcification, uh, dystrophic calcifications are not uncommon in the setting of uh, multinodular goiter. Thyroiditis, um, usually we're thinking of disorders like Graves or Hashimoto's. Um, these usually resu result in a uh, enlarged thyroid that's much more uniform in its attenuation than a goiter is. Um, depending on how large these, um, these um, thyroids become, uh, there may be some um, kind of uh, uh, crossing of the thoracic into the mediastinum. Uh, finally, thyroid adenomas and carcinomas. Uh, fortunately, adenomas are much, much more common than carcinomas. Um, adenomas, briefly, um, variable in size from millimeters to as big as 10 centimeters, um, usually discrete nozzles. Uh, on the other hand, carcinomas uh, sometimes may present with a little bit more heterogeneity, um, such as this, this example, especially when they start getting large. Um, you can see in this example of thyroid carcinoma, this enlarged, um, relatively heterogeneous, ugly-looking um, enlarged thyroid um, has started in the neck and has now um, entered the um, upper portion of the mediastinum via the thoracic inlet. Um, an example of um, thyroid cancer, um, in this case, a larger um, left-sided thyroid mass pushing the trachea side is the finding we're seeing on chest x-ray. So there you have it. Uh, it's a kind of a long tour of uh, middle mediastinal disorders. Um, when we see a middle mediastinal disorder, um, I like to always still go back to this three, two, one um, kind of um, um, mantra to remind myself of all the different organ systems that um, might be the source of the abnormality I see. Is it one of the three major conduit systems in the mediastinum, either airway, great vessels, or esophagus? Um, is it one of these uh, two um, things that are not visible unless they're abnormally enlarged, namely lymph nodes or bronchopulmonary foramen malformations? And lastly, could it be an intruder from the neck, usually the thyroid?